So thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, address you all today on this topic. Um, I should say at the start that um, uh, I will not in this paper necessarily deal with civic patronage. Um, the two topics are obviously overlapping, but uh, my focus here is on uh, legal relations between uh, former slave owners and manumitted slaves. So um, I'm taking a bit of a, a narrow view of, of, of the topic here today. Okay, now. When uh, sometime during the imperial period, um, a certain Roman called Marcus Aemilius Artima decided to erect a tomb for himself and other members of his familia, he added to the grave inscription, as was common practice at the time, a clause which declared that his freedmen and freedwomen, as well as their descendants, also had the right to be buried there. For reasons unknown to us, one freedman, an individual called Hermes, was explicitly excluded from this provision on account of his, quote, ungrateful and offensive behavior, end quote. So irritated was Marcus Aemilius Artima seemingly with Hermes that he forbade him even to approach, walk around, or linger near his tomb. We can never establish with certainty what Hermes had done to provoke the ire of his patron to such an extent, nor can we rule out that this was just another example of personality conflict, well documented in our sources, involving spite or jealousy on one or both sides of the relationship. That being said, this emphatic denial of the right to be buried with the rest of the familia seems to be at the more extreme end of the spectrum, thus making it worthy of closer inspection. It is to borrow a phrase from John Crook, one of those tantalizing law and life examples, since as we all know, the relationship between patron and client had various legal as well as moral facets. If only we knew what Hermes had done that led to him being debarred from his patron's tomb, probably the ultimate snub, not just in this life, but also into the next. Another reason for paying closer attention to this inscription, and this is the more pertinent um, uh, reason in the context of this conference and our meeting today, is that it depicts a male-male dynamic. Both patron and freedman are male. Now, should this make a difference, you may ask, as I hope to demonstrate in this paper today, the gender dynamic within the patron-client relationship is an important and often overlooked factor in understanding the law applicable to such a relationship. To give but one demonstration of this, it is worth pointing out that where the dynamic was male-male, the patron would in most instances also be a paterfamilias, the eldest male agnate in a family to which the Roman legal order granted great authority, both socially and legally. Where the patron was female, on the other hand, and given the legal position of women within the Roman familia, matters would be quite different. But before I launch into the substance of my paper today, one or two observations about the source material is required. My focus is mainly on legal texts of the first three centuries of the Common Era, as redacted and collected into the sixth century project completed by order of the Eastern Roman Emperor Justinian I. The texts have certain complications in terms of transmission and authority, uh, sorry, not authority, authenticity, but these are not insurmountable problems. Within this collection of texts, the legal aspects of the relationship between patron and freed people appears frequently. In fact, the compilers of Justinian's project handily collated most of the pertinent text into a title under the rubric on the right of patronage, Digest 37, Book 14. Without wishing to enter into the legal technicalities of this relationship, permit me to set out the main thrust of, of it, so the relationship between patron and freed person. By virtue of the manumission, the act of manumission, and perhaps reinforced by an oath thereafter, the sources are unclear, the patron acquired an entitlement to certain operai of the freed person. These are defined in the legal sources as days of work. As one would expect, the legal sources are mostly concerned with the technicalities surrounding this term. What exactly constituted a day of work? 
under which circumstances were freed persons excused from having to offer days of work and other things relating to trade and restraint of trade. But this was not the full extent of the patron relationship with his freedmen. As we all know, it had also social and economic um, aspects. Socially, uh, the client was expected to behave in a pious and respectful way towards the patron. And economically, apart from the days of work and the money that that might involve, they might even be called upon to contribute financially to the dowry of his patron's daughters. Within the collection of legal texts that we have, one thing is immediately obvious. With the exception of a handful, and I literally mean a handful of texts, most texts discuss a male-male dynamic between patron and freedman. While it might be tempting to draw conclusions as to the frequency of male-male patronage qua other configurations, the matter should be approached with greater care than that. Similar to contemporary legislation, the Roman legal approach, as helpfully demonstrated here by the third century jurist Ulpian, was to observe that in reading a text in which male patrons are mentioned, one should also interpret this to include female patrons. This would at least go some way to explaining the relative paucity of texts in which the female patron is mentioned outright. But as with most things legal, matters are far from straightforward and reading female patron into Roman legal text does not always make sense in the context. To expand upon this point further, I wish to bring in the main thrust of Henrik Mauritsen's recent monograph study on Friedman. As he has argued, quite correctly in my view, the manumission of a slave was not necessarily the end of a relationship with its owner. Rather, the move to patron and client represented a transition in which the relationship between patron and client was now viewed, at least in the abstract and according to the Roman legal mind, as, quote, quasi-filial, end quote, and where the patron was expected to guide the freed person in learning the ways of Roman citizenship through aid and counsel, rather than through by virtue of potestas. It is because of this underlying purpose of patronage in Roman law that a gendered view of the matter deserves closer scrutiny. And by gendered view, I mean situations where the patron-client scenario is not male-male, but rather male-female, or even more interestingly, female-male, the female being the patron and the male being the slave. One aspect of the relationship between patron and client, where the gendered aspect of this scenario caused specific comment among the Roman jurists, concerned the case where a patron freed a slave matrimonii causa with the intention of marrying them. The matter has been fully explored in a number of works, including Jane Gardner's important study on women and the law, as well as in a frequently cited article, albeit on a slightly later period, by Judith Evans Grubbs. While this is not the main focus of my paper today, permit me to set out as an example how differing legal regimes apply to the case where a male patron freed a female slave for the purpose of marriage versus the case of a female patron freeing a male slave for the same purpose. In the first scenario, that of a male patron and a female slave, the marriage was valid under Roman law, provided the parties had relative connubium. Given the personality-based nature of the Roman law of persons and the procreative goal of Roman marriage, the consequence of such a union, of course, would be that the children born from the marriage would, be, would have Roman citizenship if the father was a Roman citizen. Two pieces of statute law from Augustus's suite of so-called moral legislation on various family law issues deserve specific scrutiny. The first, the Lex Aelia Sensia, contained a specific exception which dispensed with the statutory requirements relating to the minimum prescribed age of freed slaves and the age of their owners. There may be a demographic element to this exception, but I won't go into that at the moment. There is also clear evidence that the Roman state sought to limit these types of marriages to certain sectors of the population, thus hinting at some sort of social disapproval, at least for the upper echelons of society. Thus, for example, the Lex Iulia de Maritandis Ordinibus banned members of the Senate and their descendants to the third generation from marrying freed people. As Judith Evans Grubbs has shown, while the Roman legal mind disapproved of these types of union, 
They were never legally prohibited, even into late antiquity, where there appears to be more of a regulatory affair in relation to these unions. Now, when surveying the opposite case, namely of a female patron and a male slave manumitted for the purpose of marriage, certain differences are visible in the legal regulation of the issue. First and foremost, the authorities were unclear and seemingly could not make up their mind whether as a matter of public policy, marriages of this kind should be accepted as legally valid according to Roman law at all. While in principle, there ought to have been no difference between the legality of a marriage of this type and those between a male patron and a female slave manumitted for that purpose. Such unions, to quote Henrik Mauritsen again, troubled the, the Roman mind um, since the gender dynamic was reversed and the familia formed in this way was, in the Roman sense, anomalous. Nevertheless, it seems that at least initially, marriages of this kind were deemed legally valid, a matter also attested quite extensively in the epigraphic record. That being said, certain differences of nuance are visible in the legal regulation of the matter. First, the exception under the Lex Aelia Sentia did not apply to this scenario, meaning that parties had to adhere to the rules concerning the age of manumitted slaves and the age of their owners at the time of manumission. In second place, although the provisions of the Lex Maritandis Ordinibus did not apply to the case directly, they could of course be caught out under descendant rule. That the matter of the legality of such marriages was still unresolved by the end of the second and going into the third century CE can be seen, for example, from two texts roughly 30 years apart in which the matter is dealt with in different ways. In an imperial decree dated 196 CE, it was ruled that a freedman who had dared, ausus est, uh, to marry his female patron could be accused in front of a judge and would be punished according to the morality of our period, since these types of unions were deemed to be odious. Roughly 20 years later, however, the Roman jurist Ulpian took a much more pragmatic approach to the matter. If the status difference between the female patron and the freedman was not too great, then any accusation in front of a judge should not really be admitted and the matter should be left as it is, in other words, as a valid Roman marriage. It is this female-male dynamic which we see in, the, in these two texts um, between patron and freedman that deserves closer inspection. Now marriage between a female patron and a freedman was one thing and even though the Roman authorities seemingly did not particularly approve of this, they nonetheless permitted it as a matter of law. It created a familia albeit a strange one in the eyes of the Roman authorities, and provided that the freedman slash husband had been manumitted as a Roman citizen, the children born from such a marriage would have Roman citizenship. So to summarize in brief, before I progress further, the nub of my argument thus far has been that we need to pay closer attention to the gendered nature of the relationship between patron and client especially where the dynamic is not male-male as is commonly portrayed in the legal sources. Given the quasi-filial underpinnings of Roman patronage, cases where the gender dynamic is the reverse, female patron and male client, lead to interesting legal conundra. Once I started looking at these instances, one closely related example identified itself, namely the situation where a freedman within the familia was accused by a husband of his female patron of having committed adultery with her. Now, as we all know, one of Augustus's more invasive pieces of moral legislation involved the punishment of adultery. The statute of which no record survives and no credible reconstruction can be made, set up a standing court in which the aggrieved spouse, usually the husband or his paterfamilias, had to try first the male adulterer and once convicted the adulterous spouse within a certain period of time, 60 days. A conviction under this law resulted in an absolute ban on marriage between the adulterous parties and in the case of the wife, a unilateral termination of the marriage by the husband and a forfeiture of the half of the dowry. In a book chapter published in 2015, this is a little bit of own uh, publication, 
which I will only mention briefly here, I investigated how this statute and the jurisprudence which developed around it dealt with male slaves within the familia accused of adultery with free female members, wives and daughters. As I demonstrated in this piece, aggrieved husbands or the paterfamilias could, after the introduction of this statute, no longer deal with the issue of male slaves accused of adultery in private and under their domestic authority. Rather, in all instances where the slave belonged to the husband, to the wife, or even to somebody else and just happened to find themselves within the familia and the household, the slave had to be accused in public before this standing court on adultery. If found guilty, the end result was that the slave was removed from the ownership of whichever individual member of the familia it had belonged to and was rendered a public slave. So far the servile members of the familia, but what of freed members of the familia, such as the freedmen? This brings us to a text by a relatively unknown jurist, which is only cited a few times in the digest, a man called Trifoninus, who was active around 200 CE and who we know was a member of the Imperial Council of Septimius Severus. The question posed by Trifoninus here is how to deal with the case of a freedman who had committed adultery with the wife of his patron or even with his own female patron married to another person. In this example, the matter is complicated by the fact that the freedman had been granted the jus honororum, the right of the ring, entitling him to be treated in all legal respects as a freeborn person. Logically, one should argue, the freedman should therefore be treated like any other freeborn adulterer under the statute. In other words, they had to be prosecuted first and convicted. Once this had been done, the evidence of this conviction could then be used to convict the wife, leading to a forced divorce, forfeiture of a portion of the dowry, and a ban on marriage between the adulterous couple. But Trifoninus argues in favor of a different approach here. His view is that the freedman should not be tried as if he were a freeborn adulterer. Rather, he should be tried as a freedman under the law. Now, exactly what that means is somewhat mysterious. The text itself, especially the first passage there, could be read to suggest that one of the provisions of the Julian law on adulteries dealt specifically with punishment of freedmen convicted of, or convicted of having committed adultery with members of the familia. One cannot rule this out, of course, since we cannot reconstruct the text of the statute as much, but it is also possible, and I think much more probable in this case, that the statute referred the matter to a different court, namely the court of the urban prefect, who dealt with cases of ingratitude brought against freedmen by their patrons. You can see that in the first text there by Modestinus. Now, much remains unclear about what this um, court of the urban prefect and the accusation of ingratitude brought against the freedman by a patron involved, and the details of the process is largely lost to us. It seems likely to have been modeled on the standing courts that we know, for, adult, for example, in relation to adultery as well, the quaestio perpetua, in terms of procedure, and what counted as ingratitude was based on context. There was clearly no all-encompassing definition of ingratitude in the sources. Look, for example, at the final text I mentioned there. A liberta is not ingrata because she, um, she um, uh, applies her trade uh, without the uh, patrona wishing her to do so. That does not count as ingratitude. So if convicted, a suite of penalties was available to the urban, uh, the urban prefect, ranging from fines, to um, on the more invasive side of the scale, hard labor in the mines or even relegation. Although according to the consensus of modern opinion, uh, re-enslavement of an ungrateful patron, of an ungrateful uh, freedman was not an option under, under Roman law. So why deal with matter in, the matter in this way? And I want to go back to this text then. If the freedman had been tried merely as a freeborn adulterer, the penalties would have been fairly light, all things considered, mostly financial in this case, 
apart from the ban on intermarriage. More importantly, the sense of betrayal of the moral aspects of the patron-client relationship and the disruption within the familia would not have been sufficiently addressed. The aggrieved spouse, his patron or the husband of his female patron, did not have protestas over the freedmen, of course, but he was clearly not wholly impotent in law. Given the severity of the penalties available to the urban prefect under ingratitude, it seems to me that the preferred reading of this final part of, Liber of Trifoninus' text, where it says that the whole point of the Lex Iulia is to save marriages rather than to undo them, um, uh, is that it deferred the matter of freedmen found guilty of adultery with female members of the familia to the court of the urban prefect. Perhaps this is what went wrong between Marcus Aemilius Artima and Hermes. Thank you very much. <laughs>